and Oscar on this Dickinson. edition of Native Report. We meet Emma, Emma Garrett, a skilled basket maker of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Nation. The moose are we learn how the Ojibwe viewed the stars in the night sky, and we'll learn Actually, about the evolution of federal Indian law. The beginnings of Oklahoma Indian law go all the way back to the early removals and the Trail of Tears. We'll also learn something new about Indian country and hear from our elders on this Native Report. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Mittawakanton Sioux Community and the Blandin Foundation. Welcome to Native Report, I'm Stacy Thunder. As a young girl, Eastern Band of Cherokee elder Emma Garrett learned how to make baskets from watching her grandmother. From her front porch, Emma is one of only a few women who make these beautiful baskets. What a beautiful thought I am thinking. At the foot of the beautiful Great Smoky Mountains in Snowbird, North Carolina, Cherokee elder Emma Garrett weaves baskets in the traditional manner. How long have you been doing it? Uh, since I was 14. Mm -hmm. Did your family do it? Did your mother do it? Uh, my grandma did. She showed you how? She tried, mm -hmm. but she didn't. I just learned it for uh, looking at it, it's river cane basket, mm -hmm. and this is double heart. Is there a reason or a story you have be behind the designs? The black is a walnut, okay. and the red one is a blood root, and a natural color. And the rim is a white oak, and the uh, uh, lace is for hickory. You have to uh, count how many you got the bottom. If you mess up, you can't make design. Well, I started off here. I cut these lengths and uh, how big I gonna make. And uh, then I started here at the bottom. And uh, I make corners. The baskets are made out of river cane. Not to be confused with bamboo, as they do look similar. Emma used to collect the cane by hand, and also bloodroot which is used as a dye. Mama. I dye I dye this red for uh, river cane. That's the only one that can dye them river cane. But it could dye for this one too, but they turn kind of yellow. And this turn kind of orange. Last time we went, it's over to uh, where I used to work at uh, uh, Snowbird Mountain Lodge. Well, I bought this one, but they get in the woods. How do you find it? What does it look like when you are picking it? They're just about that high. Mm -hmm. It's got a big round leaf. Mm -hmm. It blooms white, you know. I just use about this bit much. Typically, it will take Emma two days to make a basket about the size of the one shown here. And it all starts with splitting the cane. Let me split them. If you don't trim them, they'll cut you like a knife, a razor blade. I start off the whittling first, 
you know, I put this pad, then uh, I do this. Then I'll start on this one, like this. This is white oak basket now. Emma also does beadwork and other crafts, and even has a recording career. Use me, Lord, in the service. Draw me closer every day. I'll be willing, Lord, to run all the way. If I but she is well known for her basket making skills. Sometimes I got so many orders, sometimes I can't, you know, do all that. <laughs> I make small and large. And large, <laughs> extra how large. Is, how big have they? What is your biggest basket? About that big. I'll make money. That's what I live on. <laughs> Did you know that federal Indian law was not taught in law schools throughout most of the 20th century? In 1942, an attorney named Felix Cohen compiled the treaties, laws, solicitors' opinions, and other academic writings on Indian law into one book, Felix Cohen's Handbook on Federal Indian Law. This book has been updated many times since the 1940s, and today is updated by law professors who teach Indian law. It was not until the last three decades of the 20th century that federal Indian law became a discrete subject matter and a course in many law schools in the U.S. It became especially important in the western part of the United States because Indian tribes have water rights, which are frequently the subject of lawsuits. Indian law is even a subject on the bar exams of many western states. The interest in native astronomy has grown over the past 10 years and almost all Native American cultures recognize patterns in the sky. Their interpretations and stories of what is in the heavens differ from the ones we often hear. Coming up next, we take a look at what the Ojibwe saw. Beneath a blue sky on this late spring day, a group of educators and elders meet outdoors at the Fond du Lac Tribal and Community College for a workshop about native astronomy. Whenever we have the chance to uh, find alternative ways of teaching, and uh, especially reteaching things that were um, important to our people, it's really, um, really helpful to have, have the people come here and put on these workshops, and uh, we wanted to be part of that. We have educators from all over, that come here and uh, it's a really eclectic group of people that come here and um, a lot of them take that back with them and it just um, it's like fertilizer on flowers and, and and they take that back and it just creates new gardens all over the place for uh, knowledge and it's our knowledge and that's I think what's really important it's it's actually our, our own stories that have been um, uh, forgotten by a lot of people, but we've been able to get elders together and uh, people that, that know a little bit about a lot of things, and we bring them together and, um, and share with each other. It's really a nice, nice way of learning. There's been a great deal of gathering material for the last hundred years on the Ojibwe's, but generally the literature people gathered myths, the uh, food people gathered data about food and cult and uh, relationship to, to food, uh, wild ricing, maple sugaring. And all of these things were separate because in the modern academic world we tend to separate all these things. Well you've got to put them all together if you're going to be talking about Indians. And so 
the people who were gathering legends didn't realize that those legends had star stories to go with them because probably when they interviewed and gathered their legends it probably wasn't the right time of year so their informant didn't tell them so we've got all these legends maybe hundreds and hundreds of legends in the archives but there's no reference to stars very little we see our job here these scholars who are with this um, sky watchers program we hope to coordinate all those stories together and put it all together. And in the constellation, you have it right there. Carl's presentation well, deals with how the Ojibwe people started. interpreted what they saw in the night sky. He credits an article he wrote about Ojibwe astronomy with creating further interest in the subject. I've been giving talks on Ojibwe astronomy for years. And it, anybody who wanted me, I showed up with my my overhead uh, transparencies and gave a talk on Indian astronomy. Years ago, I published an article in Lake Superior Magazine on Ojibwe sky watchers, and that article came, circled around quite a bit. And I've got to, I got to be pretty well known when the subject came up about Ojibwe astronomy and that I was the go-to guy to talk about that. And I was about the only one really working in it suddenly the interest just bloomed about 10 years ago. I was always interested in astronomy, but it was Western astronomy. Now, my father apparently knew a great deal of Ojibwe astronomy, and he told me a couple of stories. Like I said, I was a young man, didn't pay much attention, and then all of a sudden, about 20 years ago, I started thinking about it again. And this was one of these times when you kind of wish your father was around because you can go back and ask him, but by then he had passed. And so I just remember just a few of the stories and a few of the constellations that he identified. One story is depicted on a rock wall overlooking a lake near Carl's home in Ely, Minnesota. There's many legends about the winter maker, which is a giant that brings the frost, it brings the snow, it brings the ice. And many Ojibwe legends tell how different other characters trick the winter maker. That seems to be holding its grip on the north and they figure out a way to trick him into leaving. Well, the winter maker constellation rises in December. It comes up over the horizon and it's fully complete. You can see the whole constellation as soon as winter settles in. In the spring, the winter maker constellation is starting to slip into the west and it's, it's tilting over. He's losing his power. The winter maker constellation is the biggest constellation that we have in the night sky. It's Orion. The Hegman Lake rock paintings are uh, a great moose. There's a great figure with outstretched arms, and that's the winter maker. And there's a panther or I should say puma, uh, that's depicted there as well. And then there's other uh, markings in other parts of this big cliff that the rock paintings are on. The big figure with the outstretched arms, I realized that that was the winter maker. And that looking up at the constellation of Orion, those great big long outstretched arms, connect to two bright stars, Procyon and Aldebaran. The rock paintings also have heart I guess, the, I guess the scholarly term for it is a heart line. That is, most people, when they reproduce the rock paintings, think of them as silhouettes or a solid color. But there's actually heart areas that are rubbed away, showing where the heart is of the moose, of the puma, and of the winter maker. And they match with stars in the constellation. There's a little star that marks that heart. Did the idea of this great cosmic moose come first with the big heart indicated on it? Or was it the constellation that came first? And then they created the moose from the constellation. Carl is quick to point out that this is his interpretation of the paintings and that stories may differ from region to region. In Ojibwe culture, different locations, different geographic regions might have a different constellation and different legends. And people are looking for absolutes. Well, in Ojibwe culture, you don't have them. Uh, the story told at Malax might be completely different than one told at Madeline Island. 
if the Ojibwe say that at the, the winter solstice, the winter maker rises completely above the horizon, that's science because people predict it and they, it's predictable and it happens right on schedule. That's science. The Fond du Lac uh, community is really appreciative of, of having people come and help us and learn, relearn things that have, um, that have been there forever. Our own stories are up in the sky and uh, they're there for us. My dad's name, uh, well, he's been gone about two years now, two and a half, and his name was Tabado Kasapa Itokab Najinshni, which means do not stand in front of the black buffalo. <laughs> and uh, they, his father gave him that name when he was just a few minutes old, held him up to the stars around midnight when he was born in those direction, welcome him to those relatives. Because we say we come from the stars, and to the stars we return, we come from the earth, to the earth we return. I really mean that uh, because those are the buffalo stars, particularly. It's, uh, and there's places on earth that match those places in the sky. Specifically, as the Wakpa Tanka or Haha Wakpa, what here people would say Mississippi, we called here uh, is the Wanagi Tachanku, also the Milky Way River of Stars. They match. So there's a cave by the river down here that match a star in that buffalo constellation up by the Milky Way. So like those teepee poles, they connect us literally between places here, places there. It's like a mirror. The development of federal Indian law has its roots in the state of Oklahoma with the federal government's policy of removal and the Trail of Tears. To help us understand this history, Native Report consulted G. William Rice, co-director of the Native American Law Center at the University of Tulsa. It is mid-afternoon when we reach John Rogers Hall on the University of Tulsa campus. The hall is the home to the College of Law and the Native American Law Center, a leading research center for law and history. Today, we'll meet noted legal scholar G. William Rice. Thanks for doing this, Professor. Can you explain the evolution of Indian law in Oklahoma? The beginnings of Oklahoma Indian law go all the way back to the early removals in the Trail of Tears. Um, when Indians from the five civilized tribes were moved to Oklahoma, uh, then Indians from all over the country were moved to Oklahoma, both from the east and the north and the west, uh, and from the, the southeast, everywhere around the United States, there were tribes moved into Oklahoma. This was the great part of the great American desert. It was part of the area where no self-respecting American would ever want to live. Um, so it was the place to settle tribes that needed to be moved in the American sense um, out of the way of the American uh, expansion. Um, then in the 1890s began the allotment of the lands in Oklahoma. The Oklahoma land runs were uh, attempts to settle uh, the remaining Indian lands in Oklahoma that had been taken from the tribes by the United States. The university is actually on the lands of the Muscogee Creek Nation, which borders on the Osage and Cherokee Nations. Those were treaty designated areas, uh, all of which were land swaps uh, in the view of the United States, where the Cherokees and Creeks, for instance, came out of the southeastern part of the United States, and when land was ceded there, uh, lands were obtained here for the tribes. Uh, the Osages came out of the Missouri area and uh, were also back and forth, and this was treaty designated boundaries. Uh, so just a couple of blocks north of here, in fact, and then out west you come to the uh, about, oh, a mile and a half, 
you come to the place where the Creek, Cherokee, and Osage reservations all meet. And about two blocks north of here is uh, the boundary between the Creeks and the Cherokee. The, how do you deal with this statement, and I've heard it a number of times, there are no Indian reservations in Oklahoma? Well, I'd simply say that the Tenth Circuit has on several occasions said that particular tracts of land, uh, including the track right here in Tulsa where the Creek Nation Casino is located, are 1151A Indian country, and that is Indian reservations. Um, I would also say that uh, that's just part of the myth. And when uh, I, I was uh, lucky enough to argue a Supreme Court case, and when we got the decision back, the decision was that the Second Fox Nation had an informal Indian reservation here in Oklahoma, uh, and that it was Indian country based on the Supreme Court case. So that is part of this mythology. And part of this myth, if you will, that tribes in Oklahoma are somehow different, or tri the Indian law in Oklahoma is somehow different, uh, is also interrelated to the land runs and to the uh, uh, attempts by Oklahomans to make a living off of Indians and Indian property. Um, it was so bad that when they uh, were doing the Indian Reorganization Act and the Oklahoma Indian Welfare Act in the 1930s, uh, Osage County um, objected strenuously to those two acts and their applicability to Osages um, because the Osage County was based on living off the Osage oil royalties. That attempts to exploit Indian lands and Indian property, um, I think, had a large part to do with this development of this mythology because, of course, if they had no tribal governments, if there were no real reservations, if Indian law here was different from where it was everywhere else, it made that exploitation a more simple process. Exploitation came in many forms. The Allotment Act itself was seen by some as a means to further strip away Indian lands. When we started getting leases for minerals or farming or grazing or rights away or whatever it might be, the oil company or the rancher pays the BIA the lease money because that guy doesn't know how many heirs there are on the property. They don't know. Uh, you know, who owns the property, it's in federal trust. Uh, oftentimes even the owners don't know who owns the other interest in the property because by the time you've tracked down 400 people, some of them, somebody died and now you don't know who the heirs of that person are till it's probated. And all of this type of thing happens. So the money gets paid to the BIA. The BIA puts it in a account and then they start looking through the, who the heirs are to decide how to divvy it up. In the 40 days to 60 days it takes them to make those decisions, that money earns interest. But they, don't, they didn't divvy up the interest. Sometimes it didn't get credited to the proper fund. Sometimes it didn't get accounted for properly. Um, sometimes it's impossible to tell whether the tribe or the individual Indian got the right amount of lease money. Um, oil leases were notorious for being honor system uh, situations where the BIA would send off a document to the oil company that said, how much oil did you produce last month and what did you pay yourself for it? And the oil company would fill it out and send it back. And then the, oil, the BIA would calculate the royalty based on what the oil company told them they had produced and sold for and then send them an invoice for the royalty that they calculated from the amount of oil the oil company said they produced. Nobody checked what was really produced out of the well. That's Cobell. What's the future of Indian law in Oklahoma? I think it's pretty bright. Um, one of the things that I think history or, or this last 30 years has shown us is that basically what's good for Indian tribes in Oklahoma ultimately is good for all Oklahoma. All of the economic activity, some of the tribes now have uh, 
massive uh, investments in different kinds of businesses. It's not just gaming, it's all different kinds of things that tribes are involved in, plus uh, resources that the tribes have themselves and that they receive from the federal government are all beneficial to um, what other tribes are doing across the country has been beneficial for everybody. For more information about Native Report or the stories we've covered, look for us at nativereport.org and on Facebook. Thank you for spending this time with Native Report. I'm Stacy Thunder. We will see you next time. Stacy Thunder is a member of and legal counsel for the Red Lake Nation, and Tad Johnson is a member of the Boys Fort Band of Chippewa and is chair for the American Indian Studies Department on the campus of the University of Minnesota Duluth. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Mittawakanton Sioux Community and the Blandin Foundation.